Marden Quarry Nature Reserve is home to a variety of wildlife. Canada geese are a familiar sight and breed here in the spring. With the distinctive emerald green head of the male, the mallard is one of our most well-known ducks. Grey lag geese chicks are cute, whilst the large feet of the moorhen give him an ungainly and comical appearance. If it's grace and majesty you're after, the mute swan fits the bill, whereas the common brown rat has a rather bad press. And when evening turns to dusk, out come the resident pipistrelle bats. And who knows which other creatures are astir. Right, you can stop trying to find the whiskey now, you dopes. I'm the only whiskey you'll see in this movie, not in a bottle. This first piece is my favourite. I always have my dinner at the breakfast time because I can't wait until dinner time for one thing, and then I might get some more at dinner time if I've got no more dinner to have. Ah, here it is. I know you'd like some, but you can keep your hands off, or I'll have your fingers. And I like fresh meat as well. You know, my man likes to brush me. Says I'm a good boy, look a little smashing and all that jazz. He thinks I lap it up. It's all rot really, but I usually get a cup of tea at the end of it, so I have to play up to him. Hey, haven't you finished yet? You'll have that ruddy dustbin full and I'll catch my death of cold. Ah, that's finished. I don't look too bad really now, do I? Now where's the tea? Ah, it looks like a juicy carrot instead. Still, it's better than nothing, I suppose. Oh, good job I kept my teeth in. Clean up the bits, they'd say, if I'd left that bit. Now for some fun. Supposed to head the ball back to him I am. I'll beat him to it this time. I say the old boy is on the ball today. I suppose he thought my bit was a fluke, so I'll do it again a couple more times just to prove it's not. Two. Here we go, I'll get it this time. You want to hear the carry on to pull him? Good boy, clever lad, clever fellow. I don't know what the neighbours think. I'm supposed to be playing tug of war here but I'll have a bit of fun. Why should I pull that lump about anyway? Oh, it looks as though we're off, folks. I never know where we're going, or why we're going till we get there. Sometimes it's the field. That lamp post was put there just for my convenience. Ah, it looks as though it's the field today. There it is across the road. We don't dash across, wait for it. They don't like me to rush. Here's my stock of sticks for throwing. Whee, here we go. How's that for a nine-year-old dog? Did you know I got my name because they said I was full of spirit? I heard them say they'd pretend to throw it for me, so I'd not find it. They wanted to shoot me in the long grass or something. I wasn't going to let them until I found out they meant to shoot me with the camera. Here it goes. Oh look, behind her back. I'll play along with them for a bit, and then I'll tell them I want it thrown proper like. Come on now, throw it, no more nonsense. Wake up cameraman, it's gone dark. Strike a light. No, open up a stop, you nit. They can't see me. What? Time to go already? Just because I called him a nit. Right, I'll not stop at the curb. In fact, I'll have a lie down in the middle of the road. And have a chew. That's a laugh. When the old boy was cross, his missus said, Ah, bless him, his affections were divided. 
Here I am, first home again. The old girl looks all in. Can't keep up with me on my can of meat, can she? Come on here now, open the gate and let's get in for a snooze. That's all for now, folks, but remember, this whiskey's not out of a bottle, but I can still give you a headache. Mr. Holmes to see Dr. Watson. <coughs> Mr. Bond to see Dr. No. Mr. Earp to see Doc Holiday. Mr. Stanley, we're sorry, but Dr. Livingstone cannot be located at the moment. 
so you will be seen by Dr. Crippen. In the 17th century, a method of turning church bells through a full circle with wheel and rope was developed. From this evolved the practice of not merely ringing a fixed pattern of notes with different bells, but of changing the order in which they were rung, so that an almost infinite variety of note patterns could be obtained. So let's see some of today's bell ringers in action. Trouble's going, she's gone. Keeping an eye on proceedings in the ringing chamber is Karen. I'm the ringing master and that means that when we're actually ringing, whether on a Sunday morning or at practice nights or any other time, I'm the person who organises the ringing, deciding what we're going to ring and who's ringing which bell. A fixed camera placed up in the bell chamber for the benefit of visitors allows us to see the bells in action on a monitor without having to stand too close for comfort. Here at Christchurch we've got a good team of people, all sorts of ages ranging from 16 to, well, let's just say well over 70, shall we, and be diplomatic. Um, a very interesting mix of people coming from all walks of life. And we do just enjoy being together and learning together and most of all, ringing the bells together. One of the longest serving bell ringers is Mike. I learned to ring about 60 years ago, um, but really I've been ringing continuously for about 55 years. My father taught me, he was ringing master here. My grandfather was ringing master before him, and he learned to ring in Derbyshire, taught by my great grandfather, and his father, my great-great-grandfather, um, taught him to ring. So I'm the fifth generation, so it's a huge family thing for me and something I'm very proud of. This is a model of one of the bells upstairs. The bell is attached to a headstock, which is attached to the wheel, and there's a rope attached to the wheel. On the other side of the headstock is a piece of wood which is called a stay, and this is engages with another piece of wood called the slider. When we arrive uh, in the belfry to begin ringing, all the bells are hanging downwards for safety, and before we start, we have to raise them into the upright position and we do this by swinging the bell backwards and forwards till eventually it stands in the vertical position. This means that when the bell rope is pulled, the bell starts ringing straight away. Each time the rope is pulled, the bell revolves 360 degrees to the vertical position and then the rope is pulled back again and goes round to the vertical position. Now the bell ringer has no control over the bell once the bell is starting to move and uh, completing a full circle. They can hold the bell in the vertical position to make it wait or they can restrict the bell so it doesn't quite reach the vertical position. By doing this they can ring a little bit faster and a little bit slower. When we're ringing, there are two parts to our ringing action. The bell has two different strokes. Because it turns full circle, but we can hold it on its balance point. The first part is when our arms are right up in the air and we just have all the very end of the rope. We call it the tail end. 
and we pull that down and that's the backstroke when it's coming back down to us and then you'll have noticed a long stripy fluffy bit in the middle of the rope which we call the sally when we catch that we call it the hand stroke so we handle the sally let go and then back down with the backstroke The tower was built in 1786 and um, the first six bells which were um, due to be put in the tower were lost uh, at sea on their way from Whitechapel Foundry. A second set of bells had to be recast and they arrived in a ship called the Happy Return in 1787. Two more bells were added in 1874 and then two more bells in 1878, giving us a ring of 10 bells. The lightest bell is 400 weights, and the heaviest bell is 1600 weights. And bells are always measured in old measures, 100 weights, quarters, and pounds. I suppose um, in today's measure, the, the heaviest bell is about three quarters of a metric ton. almost like a kind of ringer's bible once you start ringing changes. This is the book of diagrams and inside it's full of diagrams of methods we can ring. Here are some of the ones we can ring on five bells and then it's got some you can ring on six and if you look at the numbers you can see that we always start off going from one to six if there are six ringing and everybody swaps places, but you can only move one place. Somebody once described it as intricate dancing steps, but using your bells. To ring these methods, we have to be able to change places with each other. And we do this by holding the bell on its balance point. When we ring, we start off ringing from the highest note bell to the lowest. We call them one, two, three, four, five, six. When we want to do some ringing, we often will call the changes out to swap pairs of bells. So we would call two to three, and then the two would follow the third. So instead of one, two, three, you would get one, three, two. And we call that call changes, which is how everybody starts ringing. We ring for Sunday services and any other church occasions we are asked to ring for. But we also ring for national events such as royal weddings, uh, coronations, funerals of uh, prominent people and uh, royalty of course. And um, we've been doing this now for over 200 years on sp other special occasions on New Year's Eve when we ring the old year out and ring the new year in, um, which is always a very pleasant occasion attended by friends and family. Good night, Charlotte. Sleep tight. Night, night, Grandad. What? 
up there. Grandad, two The Rosses Express is a road train which takes sightseers on scenic tours in and around the seaside town of Rosses in the Catalan region of northeast Spain. The train operates a number of different trips. Our 18 mile circular route through the national park lasted two hours and climbed to the highest point on the Cap de Croix Peninsula in the eastern foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains. We joined the train outside our hotel in Rosses. After a brief run through the town to pick up more passengers, we headed along the seafront. A detour through the harbour area showed off some of the dozens of expensive boats moored here. After passing a couple of secluded beaches to the east of Rosses, we left the main roads and began climbing in earnest. When we found ourselves speeding along a dusty dirt track a hundred feet above a sheer drop into the Mediterranean Sea, we suddenly realised this was not the usual tourist trip we had been expecting. A recorded commentary in various languages described some of the more interesting features we passed. For example, this is the site of a former marble quarry, which provided material for some of the prominent buildings in Barcelona. The fertile land which supported vineyards was left behind and it became bleaker and more desolate as we climbed higher. Eventually we reached the top and we were able to get out and stretch our legs. Fortunately it was dry but windy. I certainly wouldn't like to be here in bad weather. This cairn marks the summit at 1,634 feet above our starting point at sea level. Away in the distance we could see the Bay of Rosses. After wine and biscuits we took our seats for the journey down. We were soon kicking up the dust again, noticeably faster than on the way up. Eventually we reached proper roads and arrived back at the hotel safe and sound.
What an experience. Highly recommended. Right, we're off to the park with Grandma. Lots of things to do, but first, something to eat. Hi Archie. Hi Rosa. I love climbing. So do I. Watch this. Right to the top. Now's my chance to surprise Archie. What on earth is this meant to be? No idea. Want to see a cartwheel? How about with just one hand? Oh, now you're just showing off. Hang on, where are we off to now? Ah, a spot of golf. This isn't as easy as it looks, you know. Hooray! Yay! Okay, good. One last shot. Done it. I did it. Next. Now listen to what the man says, Archie. You haven't tried this before. This looks easy. Oops. Oh dear. This time. Oh no, it's gone wrong again. Third time lucky. Got it. Nearly. Look, I've got the hang of it. Oh, brilliant. Right. Aim. Fire. I've hit it. Have another go, Archie. Yay, bullseye. Okay, what's next? Want to see another cartwheel? This is like being in a gym. My mum pays a fortune to do this. I can do it for free here. Let me have a go with you, Archie. I don't think my arms are quite strong enough for this one. I think this is like skiing. Oops, I'm going backwards. Ah, that's better. Actually, I think it is easier going backwards. I wish you'd hurry up. I fancy having a go on that one. <laughs> oh, you're not finished yet. I'll try this instead. That's enough exercise for one day. Do you think I'll suit these shades? Yeah, we're a couple of cool dudes. Fantastic. I'll be back. Fifteenth of October two thousand and sixteen. Present Detective Inspector Briggs and Detective Constable Henderson. Now then, you've run up quite a collection of charges here. Have you anything to say before I read them out? Not really. Read them out. Let's get on with it. Seven items in all. No seat belt. Exceeding European working hours directives. Over the alcohol limit. No VAT returns, animal cruelty, illegal entry and undeclared imports. So, what have you got to say about it now? Looks like it will be worth boxing day as well now, Rudolph. <laughs> Thank you.
We arrived here at Boggy Creek. Yes, you did hear it's right. It's situated to the east of Orlando, on the edge of Lake Tohopekulago Everglades. The inlet is pretty, though often quite noisy. All of the boats here are motor-driven. Marshland best suits the flat-bottomed airboats. They can just skate over small sandbanks even. The waterways are patrolled since they were attached to the national park. Laws are likely soon that will prohibit their use. So-called wildlife protection, which would drastically reduce visitor numbers. There was plenty to watch, with various small craft going out and others returning. We occupied ourselves whilst we waited for our airboat by observing people mooring or in this case recovering their boats from the creek. And they certainly were, enough to burn our legs. We had to sit on the front of the edges of the seats until they were cooled. We were all given air defenders and they were worn for the whole trip. You'll know why when the engines start. There's one. when they hatch out. The females can lay anywhere from 20 to 60 eggs at a time. They only have about a 10% survival rate out here in the wild after they hatch. The worst predators is the blue herons and the white eagles.
of being in the right place at the right time today. The gators are moving around a lot because it's well, it was noisy, but we saw two alligators and it was exhilarating. We couldn't have seen this place without the airboats, which have been here 80 years. It hasn't driven away alligators, herons, kestrels, eagles. They've accepted the noise. So why can't we? Fascinating. Your ability to create something of such vivid imagination, seemingly out of nowhere. The intricacy of your brush strokes, your wonderful, bold, exuberant use of colour. This could easily have emanated from the pre-Raphaelite school of Hunt, Malay or Rossetti. Although, given the remarkable way in which you've captured the nobility of the beast, might it be presumptive to suggest the influential hand of George Stubbs? Or even the great Victorian artist Sir Edwin Landseer? No matter. This truly is a masterpiece. Philistine. Philistine? Never heard of her either. Right, 64 Emerald Green. <laughs>